Good morning, everybody. Um, Stephen, I hope, is enjoying some sunny weather down in deepest, darkest Cornwall. Um, so this morning, you have me, and Joanna will be speaking to us later on. Um, whether you're here in the building or joining us online, um, we hope you'll feel welcome, and we pray that we'll all encounter God in a real and meaningful way. Let's pray. Here we are, Lord, your people, your church, meeting together in your presence. We welcome each other and we welcome you. Make yourself known to us in new ways through our worship, our prayers, and our understanding of your word this morning. We offer you our hearts and voices in praise and worship. Guide our thoughts, words, and actions so that we may do your will and serve you faithfully. Strengthen our faith so that we can bring others into the joy of your kingdom and help us to draw ever close to you. Amen. Let's stand, join together in our first song, Be Thou My Vision. Please take a seat. Uh, we have we have some notices. I've got uh, a couple of notices, and then, according to my extensive list, uh, Joanna, Lynn, Joe, and Lewis have some notices. So I'll ask them to to come up 
Um, I'm told Joanna has a notice about the Unity Festival. <laughs> um, mine first then. Um, many of you will know and be aware that Jane's aunt, Marion Ricks, passed away recently. Um, and Jane and Aubrey have asked me to say that anyone who knew Marion is welcome to join the family for a Thanksgiving service this coming Thursday, the 14th, at 1 o'clock in the church. Um, church will be open from 1230 and there'll be refreshments in the hall afterwards. Uh, my other notice today is Second Sunday. So this evening we have our evening meeting, Second Sunday at Sober. Um, and tonight we've got the opportunity to see a talk by Chris Lane from New Wine. Um, the video that Stephen's chosen for us is about the power of the Holy Spirit. So it would be really nice to see as many of you as are able, um, if you're able to join us. Um, Joanna. On Saturday the 23rd of July, there's a Unity Festival in Central Park. This used to be held on the Hoe every year, headed up, instigated, vision of Jose, and I cannot pronounce his surname, from Rwanda, a pastor who has led churches here, a church here, for, for many years. Um, his testimony of coming out of Rwanda during the genocide is extraordinary, how God saved him. But besides that, this is a festival of Christian unity, a time when there will be speakers, there will be music, all sorts going on in Central Park. For yeah. those who know people in extreme poverty who wouldn't be able to get there, a retired Methodist minister has organized a bus. He has a big heart for the poor. He works with ex-offenders, and a bus will go round. He contacted me because of the poorer area in which we live with Ernie Settle, Whitley, etc. So if anyone knows anyone, or if you just want to go, it promises to be a great afternoon. Central Park, 23rd of July, 1 o'clock start and finish about 6, but obviously come and go as you please. I think Lynn's next. As you said to me, go. Oh, you go Tim's first. pointing to me. <laughs> um, right, so CAP, um, there's a CAP money course um, starting um, this Tuesday, um, but online. So um, we're going to do an evening one online um, uh, starting 7 o'clock, probably be about an hour, hour and a half for three weeks. So anybody that wants to join us for um, CAP money online um, this week, um, let me know. Um, I'm going to ask Simon to put a post on for me and there'll be a number on there as well. Um, so, so, yeah, that'd be great. I just want to say as well that um, last week, or it wasn't last week, it was the week before actually, we had one of our cat folk um, go debt free. So that's great news. So go whoop whoop. <laughs> um, and there's another one very, very close as well. So, so that's really good news. <laughs> um, so I have a number of opportunities coming up in September to help with children, young people, the school, but to build anticipation I'm going to reveal one a week. Um, so this week um, I just wanted to advertise the youth club, Ignite Youth Club. We could really do with an extra adult. It's actually become so popular that we're running out of adults uh, and if we don't have enough we have to turn kids away. Um, so if you'd be interested in helping out on a Friday night, it's not every Friday night, um, so if you'd be interested, come and speak to me after the service. I can give you all the info. Um, they're really lovely, um, and it's really rewarding. So, yeah, come speak to me if you'd be interested in helping with the youth. I'll sit down for this one. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> okay. So uh, a quick notice about Harewood House. We're running a cafe on Monday week. It's getting really close now. Um, we've got all our teams together, which is great. We were going to have a quick uh, meeting on Friday, um, but because quite a few people can't make that one, 
Um, if you're able to stay afterwards just for 10 minutes, if you grab your cup of tea, and then we'll just gather just for a, a few notices then. Um, and next, you know, when we're out there, please come out and support us as well. Come out and buy your, you know, tea and cakes and whatever. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm um, talking about cakes. If any of you promised cakes, can you just let me know when you're going to bring them, please? Thank you. So that's that. Right. <clears throat> We've got, um, we work between the churches to do uh, events. It's called Feast of Fun. So we've got an event. I don't know if the, the thing will pick that up. There's posters around like this. Um, 19th of August. In the, it's going to be in the Methodist Church on Victoria Road um, because um, we're going to have work done in our hall in August. So we can't use our hall. Um, it's a free event for families. Um, there'll be bouncy castles, crafts, games, um, so we so West Water's coming with some water games, um, and it includes a quick lunch. So that's on that day, but you need to book in, please. So there are some flyers around like this that I've got my details on for, you, for people to book in. So you've got families that were children, you know, do, do book in for that. I think that's it. See, you can get up now. That was short, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you all. Um, on screen or on the service sheet, there are some words to join in with. I pray that out of his glorious riches, God, our Father, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. We say together the prayer that begins Almighty God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let's turn away from our sin and towards Christ, confessing our sins together, saying, Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's have some more worship now. So please stand or sit if you need to and join together to sing the goodness of God and King of my heart. Your mercy never fails me. Oh. 
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life here I've been
service we call working it out and uh, while I was thinking about this this part of this section um, I was reminded of something I mentioned in similar circumstances a few years ago um, it was the title of a book by John Ortberg and it was if you want to walk on water you've got to get out of the boat and as if that wasn't enough to think about, um, this time I kept seeing in all sorts of places the word commitment. All around us are signs of God's, God's love and commitment to us. He didn't do anything by halves. Just try and count the different colours of the countryside or list the different tastes he gave to the food we ate. Look at the diversity of life on this planet. All of that is given unreservedly for us to care for in which in return enhances our lives and demonstrates his love for us and of course there's the ultimate sign of his love which we read about in John chapter 3 for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for each of us God has a gift it's different for each of us but there will be one, however great or small. Whatever it is, we have to make a commitment to him and ask him to show us how to use that gift. I eventually found out that it was easier than I first thought. I just needed to ask him for forgiveness for the wrongs of my life and ask Jesus to step in. But I have to admit, it took a while for that realisation to sink in. Um, I used to make all sorts of excuses I'm sure I'm not alone. But for every excuse I came up with, God had an answer. And to make sure I got it, there was a clue in the Bible. I wonder if any of the following excuses sound familiar. The conversation I had in my head sounded like this. Me. It's impossible. God. 
All things are possible, Luke 18, 27. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Me. You're too tired. God, I'll give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Me. I don't understand what to do. God, I'll direct you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Me, I'm not able. God, I am able. 2 Corinthians 9. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Me. I can't forgive myself. God. I forgive you. 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Me. I'm always worried. God, cast all your cares on me. 1 Peter 5. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In the passage that gave John Ortberg the title for his book, Peter made a commitment by stepping out of the boat. When I made all those excuses, I wasn't even in the boat. <laughs> Never mind stepping out onto the water. I know now that God loves me completely. And all he asks is that I make Jesus the centre of my life. I had to climb down from my fence and walk with him on the journey he'd set out. And it occurred to me that many of our favourite hymns and worship songs would be different if those who wrote them hadn't stepped out of their boat. Instead of, be thou my vision, would we be singing, be thou my hobby? Or this one, spirit of the living God, fall somewhere near me. How about, what an acquaintance we have in Jesus. Or even, finally, amazing grace, how interesting the sound. Perhaps it's time for us to make time to hear what God's telling us about the gifts he's given us. If we're not sure what that gift is, maybe we should ask him to show us. He won't mind. He just wants us to move a bit closer to the edge of the boat so that it's easier to step out. Let's pray. Loving Father, you give us many blessings and we thank you for them. Lord Jesus, purify us and strengthen us to be your hands and feet and help us to do the things you would have us do. Holy Spirit, fill us with a joy that reaches deep into our hearts so that we may serve cheerfully. We pray for your protection from the things that hurt us and for the grace to withstand the temptations of this world. And we ask that you'll stretch out your hand to us and help us step out of the boat. The following words are on screen or the service sheets. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage our hearts and strengthen us in every good deed and word. Before we hear today's readings and Joanna's sermon, let's stand once more to worship the song Cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than God's, than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
This is a reading from Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Moral benefits of wisdom. My son, if you accept my words and, sh and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your hearts to understanding, and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver, and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in 
is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. This is the word of the Lord. second reading is from Romans 11 verses 33 to 36 a prayer of praise oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor who has ever given to God that God should repay him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. As Joanna makes her way forward, let's pray. For the steadfast message of your prophets through the ages, loving Father, we thank you. For the hope and encouragement we find in the scriptures, loving Father, we thank you. For your word that comes alive in our hearts as we hear it, loving Father, we thank you. May your Holy Spirit speak to us through Joanna as she brings your word to us this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Good morning, everybody. I was not given, I asked Stephen, is there anything particular you want me to share this morning? Any passage of scripture or anything? And No, nothing. So um, I went a few weeks ago, four weeks ago, I went to the um, Plymouth Licensed Lay Ministers relicensing service at St Andrews. <laughs> it was quite a formal event. Um, But sometimes I just enjoy that. Bishop Nick took the service and preached on wisdom. I can't remember anything else about the sermon, but I thought that is a word to be talked about, to be thought about, a word I need to focus on. So I've learned an awful lot, as usual, as I have thought about and then prepared this. One of the longings of my heart is to understand more of the fear of the Lord. What does it mean to fear God? How do I respond to that? It's not a frightened, a really terrified, it's this awe and wonder about our God, our creator, our saviour. There is so much, I discovered, in the Old and New Testaments about wisdom. And preparing this, I ended up with quite a few books around me, and then I discarded most of them. It was all too much at one point. The writer of the book of of Solomon, the writer of the book of Proverbs, is Solomon, son of David and Bathsheba. The book of Proverbs is one of three books of wisdom literature. The other two are Job and Ecclesiastes. If you've not read Proverbs through, it is well worth reading. And here wisdom is personified as Sophia. But I had another thought this morning. And before I go on to wisdom, I want to look at a word, integrity. Now, with all that's going on in the political world at the moment, it seems to be a word that springs up, integrity how we need desperately integrity in our government. And I looked up the word integrity in Proverbs. In chapter 10, verse 9, the man of integrity walks securely, 
but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Chapter 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. And then in 13.6, righteousness guards the man of integrity, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. So it's something that challenged me that I'm not a political animal at all. Um, and I don't understand all that goes on, and sometimes I just switch off the television because I can't cope with it all. But one thing I need to pray, we need to pray, is that we have people of integrity in high office in our government. So if nothing else, I will pray that we have people of integrity in high office in our government. Right, back to my sermon. What is wisdom? Dictionary definitions, I find it quite useful. I'm looking words up in the dictionary. A state of being wise. People are wise when they can apply their experience and knowledge together with the power of applying them critically or practically and having the gift of discernment. How we need the gift of discernment. But how do we seek wisdom? How do I seek that wisdom, and walk in the fear of the Lord. We are called in Proverbs to seek wisdom, instruction, and knowledge. Choose the fear of the Lord. It is the beginning point of all these. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. James taught us how to ask God so that we will receive an answer. In chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Just ask. Who gives liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. That word reproach, in other words, God does not remind us of our unworthiness. We need to ask and believe his promise. I mentioned that before, believing his promise, acting on it. He will give and we can watch the wisdom grow in us. It is one of the Lord's promises we need to hold on to. When we need wisdom in a situation, ask. And his promise is that he will give. And then in Proverbs 4, 6 to 7, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore, Get wisdom, though it will cost you all you have. Get understanding. And it's my question for me, and maybe for all of us, how do we do that? In the reading we had just now from Proverbs 2, we are called to listen, to apply our hearts, to cry out for, to seek and search for wisdom, knowledge and understanding. They come from the Lord. And I don't think we'll get those things if we hope we will find them just by coming to church every Sunday. Um, fine, tick box, I've come to church. We need to give God time. We need to give ourselves time. We need to read the scriptures. We need to share with each other, to talk, to discuss, to tease out what some of these things mean. The Jewish people used to do that, and they probably still do. They loved to discuss, to debate, and they didn't always have to agree. They were quite happy to disagree. And if you read, they would meet at the city gate. The elders would meet at the city gate, and they would discuss and talk about the scriptures. And people would come and listen, because that was how they learnt, and they would listen in the synagogues. There are study groups that we have. On a Thursday lunchtime with Stephen, Stephen's mentioned this, Thursday evening with Andy and I. I think there's another study group, but I can't think. Oh, the ladies' group on a Tuesday evening. Jo had one? I did, yes. We are, we are reverting back again, I think, in June. <laughs> 
so they are around. So do seek a study group or start one. I've started one. Two other women I've bumped into, and um, literally, and um, we meet. We've met once on a Monday evening at about eight for an hour, and we decided we would read through a gospel, starting with Mark, and then when one of us had a question, we'd say, stop, and ask a question. So we've done that once, once a month, eight till nine at my house. So learning... Proverbs tells us, and I'll say this again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. Learning to walk in the fear of the Lord is learning to live in awe and reverence of God. It is foundational to our work, walk of faith. God is loving and full of grace and mercy, but he is also all-powerful, awesome, holy, righteous and sovereign over all things walking in the fear of the lord will bring great blessing to your life i'll say here thank you dave for your testimony this morning those powerful scriptures that he said he read out to answer his questions to lead him through to a place of commitment and faith there's power in the spoken word of god and each of those scriptures he mentioned can be a power in our lives as we say them aloud to ourselves. When it comes to asking for wisdom, what does Jesus say in Matthew? Seek first the kingdom of God. He also says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock and the door will be open to you. Where else are we told to knock? In Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. What happens when you sit down for a meal with somebody? Do you just eat and not talk? And then goodbye, finish, gone? No, you have conversation. You share things. And that's the sort of relationship Jesus wants with us. We heard that with Dave's testimony. He, he asked God a question. He gave his excuses, but, 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 and the Lord answered him. It was a conversation. It might have taken a period of time, but it was a conversation. And God wants that sort of conversation with us. So it's all to do with our relationship with God. Do you have an intimate relationship with God? Do you actually spend time to sit with him and feel his presence, his love? I went to the garden house a couple of days ago, and I don't know if you know it, there's an area that used to be, possibly was a tennis court. I was there in March when they were just opening up after the first lockdown, so that was 18 months ago or so. And it was early in the year and there was nothing there were these flower borders, empty, just a few sticks showing. And that was it. On Friday when I went, it was a blaze of colour, the bees, the birds. It was just wonderful. I sat on that seat and just absorbed it in the awe and wonder of God. And I'm thinking, how did that happen? A few months ago, nothing and then months later, this blaze of colour and life. Now, I want to look at the word if. In the reading we had this morning, there are three ifs. And I remember hearing someone speak about the word if in the Bible. It's an important word in the scriptures and we need to look seriously at them. We often assume the Lord will do something for us. But we don't look at the word if. The Lord promises so much, but we need to take note of the word if. Dave, is it possible to put the reading up again? Proverbs 2, please. I think the first screen shows those three ifs. If 
we call for insight and cry aloud for understanding. If we look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure. And the third if, I haven't written it down here for some reason. The first one, if. The Lord, yes. Thank you. So we need to look at the ifs, because if we do that, God responds. He really responds to us. Then we will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So I know for myself I need to do that more. Call out for insight. Look for it. Seek it. And then the second reading, Romans 11. This comes after the longest... I read, wrote, read this bit, sentence. This comes after the longest extended theological argument in the New Testament about the salvation of the Jews who are faithful to God. He made them promises as his people. But so many have still not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Should they receive their salvation? You read those three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. And then Paul ends with this amazing prayer. Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his ways past tracing out. It's a lovely passage, and I memorized it years ago, and I keep going over it sometimes. If I can't sleep, I'll go over passages that I've memorized. The fear of the Lord leads to wisdom, obedience, reverence, to acknowledging and knowing the Lord. And in James we read, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Isn't that what we all need? That sort of wisdom. Jesus is the wisdom from God. Jesus is wisdom personified. Jesus is on our side as Dave discovered with his testimony, oh, but, oh, but, oh, but. Jesus was on his side and led him through. Jesus is on our side and will lead us through. Jesus, God wants a relationship of intimacy. And we need to hear who he is, not always what he does. There's a difference between being afraid of God and the fear of the Lord. We need to venerate, honour, respect, stand in awe of him. We will love what he loves and hate what he hates. We need to tremble at his word. We need to obey him instantly, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it hurts. I put off obeying him for two or three years and I was in a mess. And eventually I obeyed him. It did hurt. It really hurt. But he brought me through. He brought me through. Friendship with the Lord. I heard this last night. Somebody left a book out there, John Bevere, on the fear of the Lord. And um, I've started it. I've not got very far, but I've listened to him on the, on the computer, IT. Um, listened to his talk, and I listened to it again yesterday evening. And it's powerful, a powerful talk. He talked about Abraham, and he was God's friend. God saw that he was obedient to him. And he didn't actually sacrifice his son Isaac, but he nearly did. And he became, because of the obedience, a friend of God. And they would have this conversation. We want to be friends with God. But before I close, I just want to reflect for a few minutes on the last song, the next song we're going to sing. We are told in Proverbs about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom, understanding and knowledge. What is our attitude towards him? John Bevere spoke of a situation where he went to speak in this vast hall with thousands of people, mostly Christians. 
and he was shocked by their lack of reverence towards God, towards the singing. They just sang songs. The presence of the Lord wasn't there. They just sang songs. What is our attitude towards God? Is he just a friend who loves us and we love him as we love anybody else? Or is it deeper than that? Do we revere him? Do we see him as Lord and Saviour? Being in the form of God, he made himself of no reputation, coming as a bondservant in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. That's Philippians chapter 2. Do we bow the knee before God, before our Father? Do we bow, bow it and we say, yes, I bow the knee? Or do we actually get down there on our knees or flat on our faces before our God? Do we honour him in our behaviour, our attitudes, our obedience to his word? What does it mean to enthrone him and proclaim him our king? The next song, Jesus, we enthrone you, we proclaim you as our king. Do we give him all the glory? We say the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. He is a holy God and he calls us into holiness. When we sing each Sunday, do we sing and enjoy the words or do we see Jesus and worship him with our whole beings? giving him our all. My mind is not always focused on the Lord Jesus and I get distracted so easily. Before we sing, Jesus, we enthrone you. Let's just be quiet for a few moments and think about, look at our attitudes towards our Lord, our God, our Saviour.
Do please take a seat as we, as we turn to prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for those in authority, in government, in parliament, in great need of God's wisdom. As it says in the Bible in Timothy chapter 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live in peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, turn our hearts to your ways and give us peace. Gracious God, we pray for peace, justice and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honouring of human rights and for the relief of the oppressed. We give thanks for all that is gracious in the lives of men, in the lives of women and in the lives of children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this local community and for all people in their daily life and work. We pray for the young and the elderly, for families, and all who are alone. And we give thanks for human skill and creativity and all that reveals your loveliness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, when we look into the brightness of your radiance, the light that blinds, the light that illuminates each dusty corner of our everyday lives, it's hard to feel anything but embarrassed as we sit, kneel or stand in your house to sing your praises and say Amen and Alleluia. Something that still, small voice whispers insistently in our ears, there's unfinished business here. And we know it means cleaning out those corners, vacuuming out the dust and debris of the past and throwing away all that we have clung to or derived undue comfort from, to start afresh, clean, refreshed, pure, and ready to do your will. Help us to make that effort, to rid ourselves of all that is unclean so that your light may not be obscured by the darkness of our lives, but shine through us into the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in need, for the sick, sorrowful and bereaved, remembering now any known personally to us. Dear Jesus, you walked on the earth, understood the broken world, yet also rose from death into resurrected life. We pray for all that we have just named and those close to them, that they would be held at this time in your loving arms. Bless the work of the doctors, surgeons, hospital staff, carers and comforters and bring the power of your resurrection life into each situation. Come fill them from top to toe with your restorative spirit. May your resurrection life bring healing and wellness into their lives. May your grace carry them through hard times and difficulty into a new season filled with hope and joy. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Lord, we pray for the renewal of the church in faith, love and service. We pray for Stephen and Caroline and their family and for the strengthening of all who serve in this place. We give thanks for the gift of your word, the grace of sacraments and the fellowship of your people. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's wait for a moment and listen in silence as we leave space to hear what God may be saying to us. Shall we stand for a moment and sing, Great is the Lord.
lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal throughout earth and heaven above. Shall we remain standing as we say together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty creator, creator of heaven and, and earth. earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Jesus only Son, Son, our Lord, who Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us, we say together, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom. final song of worship is Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to share in this time together. Time to connect with heaven and your promises. Time to pause and join together. Time to reflect and breathe in the wonder of your love, the majesty of your kingdom, and the excitement of journeying with you. As we take our worship, praise, and prayer from this place into our daily lives, may those lives be sustained through the love of our Heavenly Father. May we feel the presence of our Saviour walking beside us and know the power of his Spirit in both our actions and our words. And may the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord.